the official NASA cuts are here. Several missions reach big milestones. The solar gravitational lens will be challenging to use in our special bonus version on Patreon, New Horizons scanning the clouds of hydrogen around the solar system. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. A few weeks ago, I reported on the rumored cuts that the White House administration was going to be making to NASA, specifically fairly deep cuts into the science directorate at NASA. But we didn't have the actual document, the actual plans. Well, now we do. And the rumors were true, uh, which is that the White House administration is planning on making pretty deep cuts to NASA's budget. And so the proposed cuts are going to take NASA's annual budget from $25.4 billion down to $18.8 billion. So that's a reduction of $6.34 billion. And a lot of the cuts are going to be the ones that we talked about earlier, which is uh, big cuts to the science directorate. We don't know which missions are going to get cut, but you can assume that climate science is going to get cut, uh, education is going to get cut, and there are a bunch of other smaller missions. We don't know what's going to happen to the big flagships like Nancy Grace Roman or Titan Dragonfly, but they do want to cut the Mars sample return mission entirely. Now, the budget says that a big priority is that they want to return astronauts to the moon ahead of China and then be the first nation to send humans to Mars. But then they talk about how they want to cut the space launch system, the Orion capsule, the Lunar Gateway. And those are the fundamentals of the current NASA plans to explore the moon. But there's no real explanation of how people are going to go to the moon and how people are going to go to Mars. I mean, I'm sure the unwritten part of this is that it's going to use Starship in some way. But of course, we're still waiting for Starship to complete its various tests. And so it'll be interesting to see if they're going to be able to catch up to China as they are approaching their first human landing on the moon. Now, there's a bunch of other cuts. Uh, cuts to Earth science, shutting down the Landsat Next satellite, uh, reducing investment into propulsion projects, including potentially a nuclear propulsion system, which would make me sad, and then uh, cuts to green aviation and a lot of the other work that NASA does. You're looking at $1.1 billion reduction to mission support, Earth science, STEM engagement, and ongoing operations of the International Space Station. So 25% cut across the board, deeper cuts to science, to the existing hardware of lunar exploration, but then potentially more budget going to human space exploration overall. Now, this isn't the end. Uh, this is like the first step. The White House administration has proposed their budget. The next step is for Congress to decide whether they want to ratify it and turn this into law. There are a lot of people in Congress on both sides of the aisle that are huge fans of science missions. And so we could see that some of that funding gets put back in. So we're, we're not sort of in the final stages of this yet. But now we know officially what the White House wants for NASA. And now we'll have to find out whether the government is going to go along with that or put together a proposed different budget. And we've got a very detailed article about this from Matt Williams on universetoday.com. And this is kind of surreal because now I'm going to talk about some really cool milestones for missions that may or may not go on the chopping block. We don't know what's going to happen. But first, let's talk about Titan Dragonfly. And this is probably the mission that I am the most excited about. This is a nuclear powered octocopter that is going to fly at Titan and explore the place from above. And the mission recently crossed a really important milestone. They've approved the critical design review. And this, this locks in its mission design, fabrication, integration, and the test plans. These are all approved. And now the next step is to actually build the thing. And the goal is to have this done and complete for launch by 2028. Of course, it's going to take many years to actually get from Earth to Titan, but hopefully we'll see it launch in just a few years. And then the other mission that reached a really cool milestone is the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. And this is the follow on success to the next great mission that's going to come after James Webb. This is the space telescope that's going to use a hand me down uh, main mirror provided by the US Reconnaissance Office by Space Force. And they were able to turn this into a really cool telescope design. And they recently completed the thermal test. So they took the satellite, put it into a 
vacuum chamber that can simulate the conditions of space, go through the heating and the cooling that a spacecraft would experience out in space, and was able to pass all that with flying colors. Now they're going to attach its solar array, and then they're going to put it through the shake test, where they shake the whole spacecraft and find out, make sure that nothing falls off of it to simulate what the actual rocket launch is going to be. And then once all that's complete, then they'll move into the final preparations for launch in 2027. Seeing the shape of satellites as they block stars. Now, last week I talked about how astronomers use occultations to learn a lot more about astronomical objects. Just by watching how Uranus passes in front of a star or watching how an asteroid passes in front of a star, you can discover moons and rings and probe the atmosphere of planets just through this occultation. But there's a really cool paper that I found earlier this week, and we're working on a story about this on Universe Today, but they simulated what would happen if you had satellites passing in front of stars from our perspective down here on Earth, which is happening all the time. And they found that you were able to map out the shape of satellites just by watching how they block lots of stars. Once you've seen a satellite pass in front of hundreds of stars, which you know, they're passing in front of stars all the time, then you actually can tell the shape. Is it a is it a cube? Does it have solar wings? Does it have a different shape? And so when you think about how there are a lot of completely classified satellites up there, one way to find out more about them is to just watch as they pass in front of stars to map out their shape. The solar gravitational lens will be challenging. We talk a lot about the solar gravitational lens here on the channel. It's become our new Lagrange point. And obviously I'm incredibly excited about the potential of the solar gravitational lens. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is where you could go out to about 550 astronomical units away from the sun. And then you can use the gravity of the sun as a natural telescope lens. That position puts you at the focal point of this natural lens and gives you the magnifying power of a star with a telescope out of the solar gravitational lens, you could see a one megapixel image of an exoplanet, the kind of thing that you would have to build a 90 kilometer telescope to do without this additional boost of magnifying power. Well, it sounds too good to be true. Now, first, obviously getting out to 550 astronomical units away from the sun is challenging. This is much farther than even the Voyagers have gone in 50 years of travel, but there are additional problems with the lens. So there are sources of noise that you have to deal with. One issue is that you have the solar corona. This is the atmosphere of the sun that surrounds the sun. It is complicated and puts up a lot of additional material flickering light that's going to make it more difficult to use that natural lens. Another problem is that we don't completely know the shape of the sun. It is mostly a sphere, but when you're trying to use its light as a natural telescope lens, even slight changes, flatness from its turning will make the lens harder to use. But now there's a new paper that talks about an additional challenge with the solar gravitational lens, and that is clouds. And what the researchers did was simulated if you had a 13% cloud cover on this exoplanet that you're hoping to observe. And that is dramatically less than the average amount of cloud cover that we experience here on Earth. And yet they found that once you put in that cloud cover, then the images of the exoplanet that you're trying to observe become a lot more noisy. And so you're not able to produce a very nice image. And so when you add all those factors together, it's going to become a lot more difficult. Now in the paper, the researcher proposes a relatively simple solution, which is you send 10,000 telescopes of one meter across out to the solar gravitational lens, and then you could be viewing it from different perspectives. And that will clear up the noise. But you know, we don't even really know how to get one telescope out to the VSGL, not to mention 10,000. So uh, obviously, this is going to be one of these great engineering challenges. And if we can pull it off, then our view to the cosmos will change dramatically. But there's a lot of work to be done. Now we've got a great story about this by Andy Thomaswick on Universe Today. Every week we put a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner last week was a hint for Planet Nine. So thank you everybody who voted on that story. Now we'll put a new poll into the post tab here on YouTube within about 24 hours of when we put out this video. And so then you can go 
click on the poll, vote for what you thought was the best story, and we will celebrate it next week. Now, the best chance to see the poll is to make sure you're subscribed to the channel, click on the notifications bell, uh, go to that post tab, click on a bunch of polls, and that will train the algorithm, and you will also be trained by the algorithm together to see more of these polls. iSpace arrives in lunar orbit. We've been reporting on a lot of lunar landers that have gone off to the moon. Some have been successful, some have not been successful. But a couple of months ago, there was another batch of lunar landers on their way to the moon, and one just arrived, and that is iSpace's Hakuto-R, or the Resilience Lander. And this is the second Hakuto-R that iSpace has sent to the moon. If you remember, the previous one, in 2023 failed to land. There was a software glitch. It wasn't able to figure out its distance to the ground. It crashed hard and it was lost. And so they've learned a bunch of lessons and now they're back for another attempt. Spacecraft took a longer route, a more fuel efficient route to get to the moon, but now it's there. And over the next month, it's going to be getting ready practicing, um, making sure that all of its software is correct, testing out all of the instruments, it's going to try and make its landing attempt as early as June 5th. And if they do make it, then the lander is going to be carrying a lot of really cool stuff. It's going to have a mini rover, it's going to have a water electrolyzer, a food production experiment, a space radiation probe, and then a bunch of interesting cultural artifacts, one that will designate the landing site as a UNESCO heritage site. And we've got a story about this by Matt Williams on Universe Today. Rogue binaries can't last long. One of the greatest discoveries made by James Webb so far are jumbos. These are the Jupiter mass binary objects. This is where you've got an object with less than the mass of Jupiter, 10 times the mass of Jupiter, but still like not a star, but freely floating around inside the Orion Nebula. And astronomers have found hundreds of them. But the part that's weird is that they've also found dozens of binary objects. And this was an incredible surprise. How do you get two planets in orbit around each other without a star? They, did they form in place? Did they form together? Were they kicked out of some other stellar environment, found each other, and then went into their own binary planet situation? These are all puzzles. But researchers wondered, what are the chances that these planets can survive in such a hostile environment? The Orion Nebula is filled with radiation from incredibly hot stars, and this is going to wear away any planets in the environment. And so they performed a simulation to find out what would happen. And they found that most of these Jupiter mass objects in the Orion Nebula should have evaporated away a long time ago. In other words, the hundreds that have been found are the ones that remain. They're the survivors. All of the others were dissolved away a long time ago. It still doesn't explain how you get this formation. It makes the fact that these things even exist sort of rarer and more precious. We've got a story about this from Evan Goff on Universe Today. There's a strange object on the edge of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is surrounded by dozens of dwarf galaxies. These are small, low mass galaxies that were formed early on in the universe, and they are slowly being gobbled up by the Milky Way. The Milky Way is this giant spiral galaxy today, but it probably was built up by lots and lots of these smaller dwarf galaxies. And so even though these dwarf galaxies have a fraction of the mass of the Milky Way, they still have a normal component of stars to dark matter. But now astronomers have found an object that they're having a really hard time classifying. It's called UMA3U1, and it's located in Ursa Major. And it has all of the characteristics of a dwarf galaxy, and yet, it's only about 20 layers across and has about 60 stars, it has a total mass of about 16 suns. And that is a very small amount. P the Pleiades star cluster has way more mass, way more stars than this tiny object. And yet it has some of the characteristics of a dwarf galaxy. It's either the smallest dwarf galaxy that's ever been found or the farthest star cluster that is part of the Milky Way. And so astronomers are still going to try and work out what this thing is. We've got a story about this from Dr. Brian Koberlein on Universe Today. While you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, I am writing my weekly Guide to Space newsletter. This is where I cover all of the big space and astronomy news stories that we're reporting over on Universe Today. I'm not kidding, like 30 plus stories, lots of really cool and interesting stuff that we just don't have time to talk about here. 
For example, could sweating spacecraft make reentry easier? Is there a way that you can use this evaporation process to keep a spacecraft safe as it's reentering the Earth's atmosphere? We've got a story about that from Carolyn Collins Peterson. Spherex is now mapping the entire sky. We've been talking about the Spherex spacecraft. Now it's in its full operations and the science is coming our way. We've got a story about that by Dave Dickinson. And then Webb watches dramatic weather changes on a pair of nearby brown dwarfs. So Webb was tasked to look at a pair of brown dwarfs for about eight hours, and it was able to see changing weather systems, atmospheric events on the surfaces of these brown dwarfs. We've got a fascinating story about this from Evan Goff. So if those stories sound interesting to you, you should sign up for my weekly email newsletter. It goes out every Friday to 70,000 of my closest friends. I write every word. There's no ads. It's completely free. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. We've got a special longer version of this episode over on Patreon called Space Bites Plus. It's exactly the same episode, but with one more story. It's completely free and there are no ads. And this week's story is about how New Horizons is helping map the clouds of hydrogen all around the solar system. And I'll put a link to the episode in the show notes. I'm going to talk about why it's so important to continue supporting missions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Barely Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caredwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, David Mass, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hen Schultz, Hudson Ward, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jerry Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Bonso, Paul Robach, Brent Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. Now, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you missed the additional story about New Horizons. It's okay. There's a link in the show notes. You can go watch it. It's the same video, but it's longer and it's completely free and you don't have to follow us on Patreon. But what's really interesting about that story is how New Horizons is out in the outer solar system. It has already done its flybys of Pluto and Charon and then follow on with Arakoth. It's waiting for another target to be able to do a flyby of, but it's still a fully functional spacecraft that is out in this really pristine part of the solar system, a place where we've only sent a couple of missions, the Voyagers, the Pioneers, and it has a lot of work to do. It has a very high power camera. It has a lot of really interesting instruments on board that are designed to look at cold, dark objects in the Kuiper belt. And yet these objects are very useful for being able to observe the, the rest of the universe. And it's done some really important science. It's given us some independent measurements of various background radiation in the universe that then astronomers have used to calibrate their other instruments. And it just shows us that we don't know what the future holds for these missions. There was a time a couple of years ago where people were saying, well, we should cancel New Horizons. But obviously, it still has so much science left to do. And the budget that is required to keep it operational each year is very, very low. And when we think about the other missions that are already out there, they're still in full function. And yet people are wondering whether or not they should go on the chopping block. Chandra, um, you know, there are other missions that people are, are wondering whether they should cut them and for from my perspective, I continue to report on so much science that's coming from all of these missions. And even the Voyagers are still making really valuable science discoveries 50 years ish after they were launched. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to hang on to all of the spacecraft that, you know, they stop working because we've like used up all of their possible science and not because we cut their budget and moved on to other priorities. Anyway, that's just my opinion, and we will see you next week.